Caleb, maybe. Uh, would you just like to just give us just a brief background? <laughs> a brief background? <laughs> of when you started? Why you started? I've been painting forever. I'm a photographer by trade. I've been a professional photographer for 50 years. And I painted for longer than that. And that's about it. You know. These are some of my paintings. That they're all in pastel. So, anyway, beautiful. That's uh, that's me. So <laughs> beautiful. I'm not. <laughs> I didn't know I had to tell him who I was. I mean, that one. and who was it? John figured out who that we knew each other forever. And a couple other people in here. And, you know, having been a photographer for 50 some years and photographed everybody's kids and grandkids and whatever, it's, uh, I walk down the street and people stop me off. Oh, you're an owl. Yes, I am. Who are you? I have no idea who you are. <laughs> but it's, uh, and it happens all the time in the gallery. The people in the gallery, they laugh at me because, gosh, you're famous. <laughs> I don't know about that. But you get out of the building, I know. But anyway, if you can't hear me, by the way, just tell me because. Yeah. I tend to, yeah, that's as loud as I get. <laughs> Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. And who's this? I can't see. Me? Yes. I'm Lawrence. Lawrence? Lawrence, yeah. We met uh, a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah. I can't, all I can see is a silhouette. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Hi, Lawrence. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So, anyway, anyway, what I did was I had some stuff from the classes that I taught a few years ago. And you know what, I'm going to talk about this stuff. So I made copies for everybody. There's four sheets, I think. And we'll go over this stuff and talk about it a little bit. And then I'll show you what's what. What I'm going to do is, where's that thing? This painting back here is one I've been working on for a little bit. And it's not finished, obviously. But I thought, you know what, I'm just going to take that, so I still have the drawing, so I'll put the drawing on this here. And I thought I'd start out and show you and explain a few things as we go along. And I'm not going to make a finished painting in the amount of time we have anyway. So I figured I could show you that stuff. thing that came from a class I did several years ago, and I stumbled across it while I was getting ready for this, so I thought, no, I'll bring these. I'm going to talk about it. And the thing is, if, on the first page here, it says, Matisse said, accuracy is not truth. And that sounds like kind of weird. But the thing is, if you take this photograph and you want it to resonate with everybody in here, and you paint that like that, it's not going to work most likely. Accuracy is not truth. You need, the truth is what's in your head. And we need to be able to, for instance, look at that one there, which is unfinished, but you know, it's getting there. But you don't need to copy stuff like a photograph. If you're gonna take a, I'm a photographer. It's easy for me to shoot things and, you know, and make them look good. But a lot of people can't and, or won't. But you don't have to copy it exactly. Make it, make it your own painting. You know, I've changed that. You can see the difference. Can you get this? I'll post the picture right over in the video. Oh, there so we go. in the video, we'll get it. Okay, see the difference? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So I made the, pad, the pads that those green ones are sitting on darker because it's not going to look right. So we needed to. You know, accurate, if I painted it accurately, it's not going to make a decent painting. Truth of the thing is, the painting is probably more accurate because that's what, you know, that's what we see. But the photograph is not necessarily. Okay? Any questions? No. Got it. Got it. <laughs> okay, second thing is, don't let reality get in the way of a good painting, which is basically the same thing. Paint exactly what you see. You may, you're going to have stuff that doesn't look right. I have another photograph here somewhere. Yeah, I don't know what I did with it. Oh, here it is. 
Well, I didn't mean to bring this one, but maybe I can put it back here. Will this work? Yeah. There you go. Oh, that's beautiful. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. That looks pretty nice, but if you look at the trees on the left, they're all kind of, you know, there's not a lot of color. I started working on this paint on the drawing, and in fact, I was going to bring it today, but I never was able to get it finished. So I decided to bring this other one. But I would have got rid of the glare and the rocks in the bottom right corner and put in some more color and up in the trees that added a little bit of color and, you know, made it much better. That's a section of a painting. And I thought I had the full picture with me, but I didn't. This is probably a quarter of the actual photograph. So I crop it in my computer. If you got a computer, it's easy to do if you know how to use it. And, you know, and you could probably, if you got the right software, you could really change this thing a lot and make it in there, you know, change the, change the uh, rocks, put some color in them and whatever. And that big one in the middle, put something on it because you want that glaring white thing there. And then the trees on the left, I was going to put, probably figured I'd put some color in. And the ones down, like right here, just above those rocks, a little bit of color in there, add them to it, and then simplify some of that stuff. And lo and behold, then you've got a nice, really nice picture. But if you copy that, it's going to be a jumbled mess, maybe. And then we've got to talk about a lot, some, and a little. And some of you probably heard me say this because you've been to classes I've taught. But a lot, some, and a little means, quite simply, Steve, can you get on that? Mm -hmm. If you okay, so we got a lot of big green stuff, and then some of this. These things are called, if you're Spanish, tuna, right? These are called tunas in Spanish, and the, the red tunas are ripe ones, and these are the new ones that I haven't put the yellow flowers on yet. But anyway, we got a lot of green. Some, a lot of green with the pants, some of the light green, and then a little bit of the red. So you got three things, some, a lot, a little. And if you think about your paintings, it doesn't matter what the paint and the size, of course. And no two things equal, that's pretty obvious. I think most people don't make anything too equal. And then the most important thing is composition. People think that they need the color or the value, and, the, and a lot of people really push on value, and that's really important, but if you don't have the composition right, you can just the whole thing off. So work on the composition. If you make a drawing, get the drawing done. I don't always do um, sketches and notans and all those other sort of things. In fact, I rarely do them. But I start out, and when I work to make the drawing for this, I start out on newsprint, large, the size I want. I make a pencil drawing, and it may take me, depending on the subject, I might, if I'm doing a landscape, I might be able to do it in 10 or 15 minutes, the entire drawing. But if I'm doing something like those cherries or the fences over there, for instance, that's a prime example, oh my gosh, it probably take me three days to do the drawing. And then I'm constantly changing, and it just doesn't fall together. And once you get it done, then you, you know, you can go from there. But it's, uh, you gotta get the composition right and it's difficult sometimes to put the cherries in the right spot, to put the ladder in the right spot. And that's why we do the drawing, right? Makes sense. Yes, it does. You can't erase pastel, can you? I mean, like if you had a cherry and yeah, you, you wanted can. it over to the right, how yeah. would you get rid of that? You know, you, to you can take. You can. <laughs> 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 you <eat it. laughs> what happens is you can take take a brush, usually a soft soft watercolor brush, and once you start using it, you know you're not going to use it for watercolor probably anymore. But I meant to bring one with me and I forgot it. 
but you can actually take a soft watercolor brush and when you put on the first coat and you realize, hey, this is in the wrong place, right. or I put one too many cherries in there or whatever, you take the brush, dust it off, it'll just come off and you'll have dust flying all over the place. So if you want to put a mask on, a lot of people that work with pastels wear masks and put gloves on. I had some gloves with me, but I didn't bring. My hands are tough and they don't, you know, this, the paper. I'll tell you about the paper in a second. But the, uh, you can dust it off and then take a kneaded eraser and rub on it. And depending on the paper that you use, I'll have you guys come up and you can look at these papers in a little bit. But this stuff is called sanded paper. It's got a coating on it and it's rough. And, and there are people that apparently when they like, blend, like the cherries, I blended them. If you blend them, apparently some people really, they get bloody fingers. Really? Yeah, that's what I said. I've never done, I've blended some stuff a lot and I've never had bloody fingers. This company, Art Spectrum, this is the, this is Aubergine. This is the same thing as here. But they make 20 different colors, but I prefer Aubergine just because that's the way I work. But some people work in white or pink or blue or whatever. They make all sorts of stuff. But the stuff is practically indestructible. You can erase, you can dust it off, you can take the eraser, rub it off, you can actually take the thing and take a hose and hose it off. And let it dry and start over again. And if you hose it off, you're going to wind up with probably a ghost image, but maybe not. It's, it, you may get rid of it all, but you're never going to get it 100% gone. You may have a little ghost image, which some people think, oh, that's really cool, and they just work over the top of it. And pastel is opaque, so if, you're work, if you erase the cherry and you got rid of it, and Use the brush, use this stuff, even took a piece of paper and rubbed on it and got it off. You're still going to have a little bit there. But, since it's opaque, you can just go right over the top of whatever's there and it's going to cover it up. You could put white on it. These cherries, by the way, I'll tell you a funny thing about them. When I was making them, when I was making that painting, I got, I wasn't going to blend with my fingers. I don't always blend. It depends on your subject matter. But this thing wasn't quite working and I thought, you know, something's not right here. So I started blending one of the leaves and oh wow, that worked pretty well. So then I got to the cherries and I don't know if I blended them right away or not. But it was late at night and I remember my wife, I painted that several years ago. And I remember my wife said, I'm going to bed. I had enough of this. She went off and I'm still working on it. And those cherries looked like fuzzy felt balls. <laughs> and they did not look like cherries at all. And it was late at night and I thought, oh, this is not right. So I blended one of them and then I took a white or a cream color. I rarely use white, so probably a, some sort of a cream color. I put a highlight or two and that thing went in a space of five seconds from a fuzzy ball to a cherry. And I get so much comment on that thing. And I haven't sold it. I've kept it for years. But because of that, because I have, I, I read somewhere, somebody said, and I've read this several times from different artists, they say, don't sell your best paintings. Keep them. But they never say why. I have no idea why you do that. And then I remember, some of you knew Elsie Bill. I remember talking to her one time and I said something like that. And she went, what? She thought that was the dumbest thing she ever heard. And which, I'm not so sure it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, but it's come close. <laughs> why wouldn't you're painting? You're going to paint it to sell it. So why don't you sell it? Yep, I have no idea why you keep it. And what do you do if you, if you keep it? I hang it and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have no idea. So it can grow through generations. This is the painting my great grandfather did. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so anyway, this stuff is, like I said, it's, it's sandy. In a little bit, when we get through talking here, you can come up and feel these things. This company makes, this is Art Spectrum, they were from Australia. And I like, there's, there's 
different papers that they all have different textures and different pastels and different brands you can tell the difference by just you can pick it up and make them work and you can instantly tell what you got probably and it's these guys make one that's called I think it's called shark because it's the skin like the shark skin is really rough mm. and I think it, that would probably even make, me even make my fingers bleed yeah. but I was going to buy some one day and I thought, mm, no, I'm happy with this. I'm going to buy something like that for a couple of reasons. Number one, it might be hard to bleed. I have some other papers here that are La Carte that's made in France. And I really like the La Carte paper, but I don't use it because they don't have a dark enough color. They've only got like half a dozen colors. And they all tend to be kind of pastel -y. And if you rub it, you can feel that it's not sandy and it's not going to make your fingers bleed at, at all, even if you have sensitive fingers. But if you go to blend like those cherries, it is impossible to blend with that stuff. I don't understand that. I have no idea why that is. But if you make a cherry on here, you can rub it, blend it, make it look nice and bright and shiny. You do it on the card paper and you rub it and it won't even, it won't even work. It doesn't work. There's no such thing as a blending tool beside your finger. They you are use, all like kinds of blood. Blood. there's all kinds of brushes and blending tools and stuff. But they don't work like your finger. The best thing you right. got is yeah. your is actually your little finger. <laughs> and I've read that over and over again. The little finger is the best thing. And it is far and away the best thing. I've, I've tried brushes, I've tried a couple of tools and all they do is move the pastel around. Okay? So where are we? Going to the group. Work thin to thick. That's fairly obvious. It's just like um, working with oil paints. With oil paints, you work thin, and you do, as you go along, you get dark, thicker and thicker, and you know your paint theoretically. You know, not everybody does that, but sometimes you just add more thin layers. But a lot of people they put on the heavy layers. I, I'll tell you a funny story. One time I was at a show at the at Art Association of Carmel. What is it? Carmel Art Association? That's in England. Yeah, no, Car Carmel. Carmel, not Carmel Valley. Carmel Car The one in Carmel. Oh, the one in Carmel. Uh, Carmel Art Association. Carmel Art Association. My wife and I were there years ago, and we were walking around looking at things. And as we came out to the last room, they were having a miniature show. So we walked in the room, and here's a wall with all these paintings. The biggest one frame and all was about that. And there was three or four paintings that the paint on them, I kid you not, was like this thick. <laughs> and right in the middle of the paintings was a handmade sign that said, touch. on my word of honor, it said, wet paint, don't touch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. And they didn't even let them hang this crazy oh, thing. Oh, and it was like this thick. That stuff was going oh. to take 10 years to dry. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, thick to trans, uh, thin to thick, I'm sorry. And it's easy to do, and with the different pastels, you can start out with, these happen to be art spectrum paintings, and they're what's called a medium. So they're not real soft, they're not hard at all. Hard are the little square ones, which I never use. And there are people that just use them for everything and do outstanding work. But I don't use them just because I don't use them. And I use mostly Art Spectrum and Rembrandt, which are both medium pastels. And then I have soft pastels, which I have some in some of these boxes. They're really soft. And when you get to, when I get done with this painting, the last thing I'm going to do is put the flowers in. They haven't, and I'm going to put them in with a real soft um, yellow paint or yellow pastel. Because you're going to pop right off of there. And I'll probably put some more yellow on there. I'm not going to work on this today because I've been working on that at home. Yeah. Just because of time constraints and stuff, I don't want to. So I'll do a little bit on here. We probably, once again, we won't finish it either, but I'll give you an idea of what to, what we do, you know. But the soft, the softer ones, you can put them on there and, you, and get the thick painting. You don't have to push hard. If I push hard with uh, art spectrums, for instance, I could get a heavy 
a heavy coat on top of the thin coats. But if you use the, um, there's several brands that I'm out of my head right now, but I have some at home. I didn't bring them, but actually I did. I brought a couple of them. But they're real soft, and you put them on there, and you don't even have to push them. You've got a real heavy coat, and it's intense. And the colors are just, it's a whole different ballgame. And you put those on last. Okay? Work dark to light. And sometimes it's, you know, it's just like oil painting. You work, start out with the darks and work your way to the lights. But you don't have to necessarily stick to that. You can go to, you know, when you get finished, you can, you know, oh gee, I need more shadows down in the bottom there. So get some light in there. And if it doesn't work, take another pastel and put over the top of it. And you can layer these things in there. Some of the papers actually advertise that you can put 25 layers of pastel on the same sheet. Wow. And I think that, you know, that's extreme. <laughs> that's a little extreme. Some guy is in a lab putting on very carefully 25 layers because, no matter, you know, I couldn't get 25 layers. I used to work in watercolor years ago and I would get, mm, man, lots of layers, but I, don't, I couldn't even come close to 25 layers of pastel. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lawrence? Yes, sir. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Let's go to page two real quick. See what's happening. Oh, here's the next step. We're going to skim through this stuff. We don't have to sit here and here. Go to a class. I break my pastels into thirds, and there's a reason for that. Some of this stuff might be interesting because we're not going to, it's not like a workshop today. And if you're talking about workshops, I'm doing a workshop for the CCAA next month, uh -huh. and which I think I told you that a little bit ago. And I do them uh, occasionally, but if I'm doing a workshop, I explain some of this stuff. This is where it came from. And so just something to think about. But I take a full stick of pastel, which is about this big, and they last a long time, which is a good thing because they're not cheap. This thing probably cost six or seven dollars. Really? And I've got 153 in this set. <laughs> I've got a set of Rembrandts that has 225. I've got a bunch of others that, you know, I didn't buy them all at once, obviously. But you start buying these things and you have six or seven dollars a piece and oh my gosh, you break the bank. But they last a long time. It's Isn't it like pretty much that if you want a color, you need that color? What? If you want a color, you need that color. They don't mix real well. You can mix them. Okay. Then why do you have so many? Well, because they... they, uh, they if you need a red, an intense red, but maybe you need a lighter red, hard to get that dark red to light. You can mix it with white or something, I guess. But most colors have in pastel sets you get like just like six or seven different tints and shades of the same color. And I've seen pictures of people that'll have a table like this with I kid you not four thousand pastels in sitting on the table. And they're in little compartments. And all the blues are in one and all the pinks are in one and all the earth tones are in another one. They take the wrappers off and put them all in there together. And I can sort of see how you can work because when you're looking right at them, but then at some point you've got to order another one. Yeah, figure it out. And how are you going to do that? Because just looking at just looking at this one set I've got here, there are probably ten different shades of red. There's more than that shades of blue. There's half a, almost double that number of greens. And if you've got them all in one thing, and you've got six different sets, and they're all jumbled together, how the heck are you going to order one? <laughs> Sometimes you can pick one up and you can make a mark on a piece of paper or whatever, and you can tell what color you've got, maybe. But they've got numbers on them that I'll show you what it. This one is P 
P540. P547. P is the color itself, darker light. And there's like half a dozen different ones for each color. And the 547 is the actual color, or whatever this happens to be, which happens to be Australian red gold. So there's like half a dozen of this one. So what I do anyway is I cut these things in thirds. I read this in a book one time that I bought when I first started doing pastel. And the guy said he cuts them in thirds. You cut them in thirds and make sure that the one that has the numbers on it, oh, yeah. the label stays on it, and it's the last one you use. Because you use the other two first. And boy, there's been times when I got to the end and I found something there that I didn't have the... Mm. Rapper on it, and I had no idea what I had. And it's almost impossible to tell. Okay? That's okay. So I talked about the compartment and trays. I don't know how they do that. That baffles me. But there's a lot of people that do that, so it must work. I don't, like I said, I don't know how they do that. In the paper, there's all kinds of papers. Mitientes is. This stuff here, that's not it. Similar to this, it's just like kind of heavy colored paper. And a lot of people use it. I, don't, I personally don't like it because one side is smooth as can be and the other side has like a waffle texture to it. I hate that stuff. And I don't know how the pastel sticks to it. It'll stick to the stuff I use and it's the way it's coming off. How far do you have to get to get those supplies? Do you have to order them online? Or is there a store anymore? that? The closest place you can get them now is um, Lens Art in Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And they've got a really good, they don't have all the pastels. Like I have some stuff called Diane Townsend and a couple of other ones that they don't have those particular brands. But they do have Art Spectrum, and Rembrandt, and Shrinkies, and a couple of other ones. They've got a really good selection. So brace yourself and check with your bank before you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's like That's anything else. <laughs> well, it's like anything else. It's, I used to fly fish. And when I first started, I bought a fiberglass fly fishing rod. And I went out and I learned how to do that and keep my fly up in the air and whatever and put it where I wanted to. And then one day I decided to upgrade and I was going to buy a sage rod, which a sage rod is one of the elite ones. And I went from spending a hundred bucks on my glass one <laughs> to several hundred for this sage rod. Well, I went in the store and the guy said, take it out on the grass there outside the store and cast with it. So I went outside with this rod and there was a grassy area. And I flipped the thing up and I flipped it up. And I, and I kid you not, I flipped to fly up in the air and I instantly knew why it cost so much more money. And I hadn't even cast the thing yet. And it's the same thing with this. It's just, you know, you go and you buy stuff and spend the extra bucks on it. Yeah. When it's good, you're good. Huh? When it's good, it's good. When it's good, it's good. I was teaching a class one time and I was talking to the class about using good products, good brush, buy good brushes, buy good pastels or paints or whatever. And as I'm saying this, this guy who owned the building, in fact, walked in the room and talked over the top of me and told the class I was just telling all this stuff to that they should go and buy cheap brushes and they could go like to Michael's and buy a $5 bottle of brushes with 50 brushes in it. No, 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 no. What the heck? I mean, hair. he just talked right over the top of me and told everybody that. I couldn't believe he said that. But if you buy a brush like that, the little hairs come out and they yeah. stick in your paint. Yes. Oh, I, I got brushes when I used to do water. I've got a $300 stage. Oh my God. Yeah, one brush. Big around as my finger, 300 bucks, which I rarely use, and I spent a lot of money I didn't need to spend on that one. 
But, you know, it's nice to talk about. <laughs> that's all. I know that's good for me. Especially since I don't do watercolor anymore. Okay, so anyway, then watercolor paper, a lot of people hang on watercolor paper. The lure is soft stuff that's, I don't even know. Forget the Sanded is what I'm using here. And there's more. I have a question. Yes. When you said watercolor paper, is that the cold press or hot press that you would use? You're probably better off with cold press. Cold press has a little bit of texture to it. Mm -hmm. Rough has a lot of texture to it. So depending on what you're doing. And then the hot press is smooth. Mm -hmm. So the hot press might be a little difficult because it's so smooth. Mm -hmm. But most of the time I would think you would use the hot, uh, the cold press. Okay. But if you use, uh, I know that there's people that use um, rough. And because of the style of photographer or painting that they do, they want the texture to show. And it's going to show. Now when you get done, with the exception of like the, the picture of the cherries, there's no, you can't see the paper behind that. Mm -hmm. That was probably painted on the same paper as this. I don't remember what I did, but I'm sure it was. But most of the time, the, the paper is going to show through, which is why you don't want to use white paper. Because if you use white paper, some of it's going to show through unless you blend it all. And then the white paper, you've got all these little tiny flecks in it. looks really bad. So, just, I tried that one time, and one time was more than enough. It just doesn't work. So, and this is a black paper then? What? The background is black? No, it's this. Oh. I, I painted it black. Oh. It's yeah. probably not black. It's probably dark purple or something. Oh. I rarely use black. You, black and white are something that you don't really use a lot. And you don't have to because with pastel you got all these colors. I've got colors in here that are pink and red and blue and whatever. And if you look at them, they look white. And you could put the highlights in. But it's funny because if you pick up a stick and it's a real pale red, let's say, and you look at it, no, gee, this thing looks white. And it does until you try to make that. <laughs> you put it on there and guess what? It's not actually white. And when you put it on and you back up and look, oh, I got a red spot here, not a white spot. So then you might have to use the white. Did you paint the background first or did you paint the subject first? Probably painted the background first and then came forward. Usually it's just like painting the tractor. I painted the sky first and then come forward. The one with the fences in it, that was really difficult. In fact, I put that one off. I didn't paint that for a long time because I kept looking. I had a photograph that looked pretty much like that. I thought, oh man, this is going to be so difficult. And I look at it and think about it and think about it and finally put it aside and do something else. And I probably painted 10 paintings before I finally decided to bite the bullet and go for it. And the hard, hardest part was the part where the sun is coming around the building and the building itself. All those fences and ladders and things were actually fairly easy. But getting the light to be like that was really hard. In fact, I had to re take it off and redo it, like we were talking about a while ago. I actually erased it and redid it several times. And what paper did you use? Did you use the origin paper on that? Probably the same, yeah. I use that for almost everything. I, I, once in a while I use, um, this is uh, a cart paper that's made in France. And. Because it looks like sandpaper. It does. <laughs> it's exactly like sandpaper. Yep. Oh yeah, but it doesn't feel so rough. Yeah. This is not as rough as the other one. Oh. But this pad, I had a, uh, these guys don't make a, I like working on a dark surface, but they don't make a very, a really dark one, so I don't use it. Plus, like I said before, it's really hard. If you decide to blend something, it's almost impossible to blend on a cart paper. I have no idea. It seems like it would be easier because it's not rough, but it's not. It's really hard. I have no idea why that is. 
But it's nice. I like that paper, except for that. If I know when I'm going to blow anything, I, I may you, use it. Are yes. you going to demonstrate any? Today? Yeah. No? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. You want me to start, or should we keep going? And he'll come back if we want to. Yeah. <laughs> so, we'll see. you want me to keep going? Yeah, no, just go ahead and start. Go ahead and start. Yeah. yeah. We're anxious to see. It's a good idea to uh, have a white sheet to test your color. Because if you test your color, for instance, this green, Not very green. <laughs> it's got a blue reaction. That wasn't what I wanted. Maybe it is. If you do that, you can see it better. The color mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. against the white. And so I always have a white sheet. I have some, I bought some drawing pads that are all white. And I use those to test the colors with like this. And because once you do, you do it on here, and sometimes it's difficult to see what, especially, you know, with the aubergine, it's kind of hard to do. So what we do is, in the dark color here. So we're going to take, I usually start in the back. Let's see if I can find that. Can you see what I'm doing here? Yep. Mm -hmm. Side of the pastel or the tip? I'm using the side. I've read where people... I've read this several times. People that are really good, famous pastel painters. Oh gee, my painting improved so much when I started using the side instead of the end. Which sounds good, it's good for doing the background. But you know, sometimes you gotta get into the can you see what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now if you look here. You don't care that one's darker than the other, gonna fix that later, right? We're gonna fix it later. Put it on, just we usually just go over things really fast. Sometimes you'll notice I'm off, out of the lines. Mm -hmm. I figured out years ago that if you go over the lines and you come back in and look the color next to it, 
and it kind of overlap. It actually enhances the painting a little bit. Instead of that way, you haven't got a real crisp change in color. And it kind of blends a little bit, and it actually makes it look a little more believable. You have to be careful, of course, with it, but you don't want to get too careful when you just. See it going over there, but that's okay because that's going to. I'm going to go back over these and change the color and move them in. This is just like there used to be a lady that did a demonstration for this group a few years ago. Yeah, I forgot her name. Mary something or other, I think. But I, I don't remember. But anyway. When she paints, she always puts down, do you remember this lady, red? Oh, yes. Remember that? There was a lady, and she, she put down, covered the entire, she had started out white canvas. She was, I guess she was painting oil. Well. And then she made the whole thing this red, like, Sandy's sure only redder than that, you know? But that sort of color, but a darker color. And then she painted over the top, but, you know, oh yes, and then you leave something through. And then when she got done, I personally didn't care for it because you can see all this red stuff coming through from everywhere. But here we've got red, you know, the aubergine sticking through. And you can see it doesn't cover. And the more you go, the more it fills it, of course. But now if we do this. Do you worry about making a mess. I mean, like I noticed, I mean, couldn't you get that all over your pants? If you put that... Or your face, if you scratch In your face? <laughs> or do you worry about that? Or No. People have, like I said, they have trouble with their fingers getting blown. Yeah, yeah. And people, they, people can't handle the, see my finger? Uh-huh. People can't handle the getting the stuff on their hands. And the, uh, you get people like Cheryl, who's not here today. She went to one of my classes one time, and she said, I'm never going again because she got a brand new pair of shoes, and one of the green pastels somehow got in her shoe and killed it, and she couldn't get it off. And it, boy, this stuff, you'd think it would come out because it's just dry stuff, but it's pure pigment. Pastel is the most permanent type of paint there is. Oil paint, watercolor paint, all that stuff, they have so many binders in them and so many additives that there's other stuff and so they fade and eventually may turn yellow and whatever. Pastel, that painting of those cherries is going to look exactly like that 250 years from now. It's not going to change. Once you put it under glass, get it sealed, it's done. It is not going to change. You don't have to spray it with a sealer or anything? I don't use sea stuff at all. In fact, if you'll notice, the one with the fences, the one with the calla lilies, and the tractor all don't have um, mats around them. They're mm -hmm. all mounted, and they are mounted right against the glass. Oh, yeah. And I mounted them. I read that one day, how to do it. I thought, there's got to be a way to do this. So I stumbled across an article one time and I, that said you could do it. So what I do is, and I think I taught a class here, didn't I? You did. One time, uh -huh. Yeah. And show people how to do that. And you can, I actually, how do I do it? I haven't done it for a while. You put it down, put the painting on top of it, tape it to it, and you gotta be careful taping it to it. But then once you get it in the frame, put it back in against it to hold it flat. And what happens is this one and uh, the sunflowers have mats. They're triple mats. They're not just double mats. They're triple. There's another, there's a black one, a red one, and then there's another one back inside there. And, there. and between the second and the third one, there's a little tiny gap. So that when this thing is hanging, 
and an earthquake comes along and shakes it and the dust falls down, it falls into that gap. Okay? But I've had difficulties with, I've actually sold paintings and had people call me and say, you know, they, or they came in to buy the thing from the gallery and saw that, in fact, the dust had gone onto the mat. And I had to redo the map once or twice, and so I said, that's on this. So I figured out how to move it out of map, and I've been doing it ever since. I had zero problems. Yeah. And, you know, some people say, oh, gee, you can't sell things with glass on them, but I don't seem to have any trouble with that. It's just, I've just got a good product that's going to sell. So, so you just use regular glass, not what? special glass. Uh, no, you know what? I tried using... Uh, what do you call non glass? Mm -hmm. The problem with non glare glass is if I put one of these in non glare and I put it up like where that or up on this easel, depending on where the light is coming from, you may not be able to see the picture at all. <laughs> yep. At the Steinbeck, they had a show yeah. of a pretty famous painter. It was, you know, it was their show, and you could not see any of the paintings. Because of the non glare glass. Yeah. It gets very open. It's expensive. Yeah. Well, it's and it's expensive. expensive. But then you can go and you can buy museum glass, which that stuff is incredible. You can look right at it and you cannot tell there's glass on it. But. How much does it cost? That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the problem. And I've read, and once again, I've read stuff when people say, oh, gee, you have to use museum glass. Okay. That's fine if you're selling okay. paintings for five thousand dollars. Right. Sure. Yeah. But oh my gosh, yeah. no, if you're selling for a few hundred, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay. What about plastic glass? What's that? Plastic, plastic glass. Mm -hmm. Plastic gla plastic glass doesn't work because you get glitter with it. Plus it warps. Okay. It doesn't stay flat. And it scratches easily. And it scratches easily. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm going to skip around here because let's we'll put some red on one of those things. Find some. Can you see what I'm doing? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'll be standing right in front of you. You can see it on that thing. Yeah. Can you actually? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Good job, Steve. Okay. which happens to be spectrum red, which is what this one is also. And this is where it's nice with all the different colors. You've got half a dozen probably different shades, shades and tints of spectrum red. And you can put this one on, put this one on next to it. And it's basically the same color, just a different tint, so you don't have to use yellow to see the crazy thing. To get it to go. And then there's one here that's in between, which is about 
two bunch in between. It's like the same thing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same. There's probably two in that. Some of them may have two. It's not the same. That looks the same, but it isn't. Is it okay if I take a picture of your painting? Yes. My bookkeeper will send you a bill. <laughs> <laughs> if I sell it, I'll let you know. Okay. One thing I do that I haven't done so far is I always paint for a few minutes and back up and take a look at it. And it looks much better from here than it did when I was six inches from it. <laughs> take your glasses off, it looks better yeah. when you see your glasses. <laughs> so I, I tend to back up and go get a cup of coffee or watch the news or some darn thing for a few minutes. And sometimes I'll just quit for a while and come back to it. I don't paint, and I know people, Donna being one, that have told me that they'll start painting at 9 o'clock in the morning, and at 9 o'clock at night they realize they have been painting nonstop for 12 hours and haven't even had lunch. So sorry guys, I never ever do that. I paint for a little bit, and I don't have a set time, and I paint for a while and maybe do that little group of tunas, and then I, you know, Quit, take a break, have lunch, do whatever, maybe run some errands, come back. I might not come back till the next day. Or I may come back in 20 minutes. And it just depends on what I'm doing. Could you work on one of those and bring it more to a finished state to show us how? The blending technique? The no. I know you know. <laughs> Part B next time. <laughs> I can do that, yeah. So what are you, what are you asking me? To bring this it, thing? Like maybe that first one that you started, bring it to a more finished state. This one well, you mean? Yeah. Or, well, anyone. Just anyone. Or pick anyone, one, and, anyone. Pick one and, and, and show us the steps to get it to a finished state. Yeah. yeah the red, the red. We can do that. Okay. Even the red ones. Yeah. Yes. 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 First, you've got to wash my hands. Take a break. Okay. Do you ever paint flat, or it always has to be upright, right? I'm sorry? It has to be upright so that the powder falls. It's a joke. It's done more. I always 
I don't write. I have a, there's a picture of my studio. I have a giant easel that I work on. And the easel is tilted. This one is tipped back. If you, have, if you work on a, you know, you should tip it forward slightly. This easel is designed for pastel painting. And you can tilt it, for, you can tilt way forward if you want, but I tip just a little bit so that it's not quite straight up. And then so that the dust falls off and I have to try to catch it underneath it, which I don't have here, but I haven't lost them yet. But so, I never paint flat. So, you wrote everything in and then go back? Do I do what? Do you rub everything in like that and then go back and do finishing and blending? Okay. I do, I normally do the, all of it. Yeah. It just not necessarily the finished colors, but just right. something that, and then I go back in and work over the top of it and get the color and adjust the colors as I go. Okay. And so like this one here, probably started out something like that. And I'm using different, when I did this one, I was using Rembrandt uh, pastels. These are art spectrum, so they're a little different. And then, I don't think I have the dark color that I did the, the, down in the shadows there. I don't think I have a color that will match that, but I could probably fix it. But let's take a break for a minute because I got to wash my hands. We have a lot of sandwiches out there, guys. Get some water on this. Well, yeah. Get some more coffee. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to get some, yeah, let's get something to eat and drink for a minute. Take a 10 minute break and then we'll start again. Take a nap. Take a nap. There you go.